You've got it locked to New York's best talk radio, HTLA Radio 1, New York. This program is intended for mature audiences only. If you have any homicidal or suicidal feelings, please consult the doctor before listening to this program. Ah, yes, you know it is. Rated mature. Because I'm sitting here drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes. Mmm. Yeah, what fine coffee it is, I must say. Yes. That's what I'm doing here for coffee and cigarettes today on the Monday Mocha. Yes. Yes, the 29th of December, 2014. My God. It's going to be one of those days. Well, today on the big program, I've got everything from mall brawls. The new rage and snow in Las Vegas for New Year's, maybe. The Al Sharpton shuffle. Game over in Afghanistan, says Obama. And tattoo removal taking a giant leap forward. So, hey, come on in and grab a cup, have a seat, and light one up, ladies and gentlemen. It is coffee time. we go gang yes welcome to coffee and cigarettes on htla radio one new york and speaking of new york it's uh 42 degrees right now central park sunny not a cloud in the sky and the forecast is of course very good uh yeah look at that tuesday wednesday thursday mild temperatures and just a few cloudy skies yeah yeah i can live with that oh yes i can <laughs> And I'm sure if you're around here, you can too. Uh, so, I got a good show for you. Yeah, kind of rattled it off there in the little preempt, the little preemptive strike there, if you will. Ah, it's great to be in Manhattan. Hi, laddie. HTLA Radio 1. There can be only one. There you go. Right. <laughs> So, without further ado, welcome to Coffee and Cigarettes this uh, Monday, the 29th December, 2014. Uh, a bunch of interesting and cool and fun stuff for you here today. And, um, well, I guess I got to start off by saying, hey, Jenny in the old booth. Hey. Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, oh. Uh-oh, what did I do? Uh, That's it. Game over, man. Game over. Yes, yeah, the one and only Jenny McCartney in the booth with us today at HTLA Studio 2 in the heart the very heart of Manhattan, yes, the, the center of the city, the epicenter of cool. It's right there. And, uh, of course, <clears throat> joining us live, uh, because we wouldn't have it any other way, uh, we just wouldn't, is the one who joins us live, well, pretty much every day on this program, the, the one, the only man who taught me how to make film and television shows, the one, the only Mr. Louis Lawless, all the way from uh, Mill Bay Studios, yes, yes, the the Richard Webb, no Robert Webb. Jeez, now I'm going to get sued. 
Yes, the Robert Webb Studios in Mill Bay, British Columbia, Canada. Louis, can you hear me? Are you there? Oh, can we cuss? Can I cuss as I always do on on the show? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you go right ahead, my friend. That's uh, that's all I want from you today. That was a mistake on my part. <laughs> well, that's okay. It's okay. It's just good you're here. You know, with me in the heart of Manhattan. I lived in I lived in Greenwich Village for a while when I first started as an actor. You you don't say. I knew that. I knew that. So what's uh, what's going on in your world these days? Can you give me any help for twenty five thousand dollars? Well, really? Wow. I go a half an hour. Do I get fifty thousand? <sighs> Uh, before I answer, I really would like to know what all that money would be used for. How about it? I tried. To, I need to try and raise twenty five thousand dollars to enter in the Academy Awards, mm. and I think it's a fantastic risk because we have a tremendous chance. Two hundred. Mm. Uh, mm. There's about two hundred members that vote on it, and they all get. You have to give them a DVD now. No. Oh. Uh, two hundred members. I, I assume you're talking about the Academy members, of course. Uh, we, we're five steps away from winning the Academy Award. Yeah. And we didn't. Right, but you're not letting that get you down. You're you're actually moving forward with with a new a new film. I tried. I need to try and raise twenty five thousand dollars to enter in the Academy Awards, uh-huh. and I think it's a fantastic risk because we have a tremendous chance to. What, what, what is? Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. I understand all this. This is good, but what exactly is the film? You know the the film. What it's it's almost 2015 now. I'm I'm assuming you're talking about a brand new film. So, what what is it? I think it should be short and sweet. The, okay, the film is a short. Sex is only the tip of the iceberg. Okay, you're speaking to me in code now. It's some sort of some sort of epic drama thriller, no doubt. Yeah, is that what it is? Eighty-eight thousand dollars a year they make mm. approximately average yeah. 80s let's say Who? and there's a thousand that's 88 million dollars a year that we're paying as taxpayers <sighs> yes you well, know how to spell my last name on the check right it's louis lawless i, I certainly do I, I i keep writing you checks yes i got lost h t l a o h t l a hell is that mm-hmm. okay right and i finally figured out how to uh, edit well, that's good. That, that's good. Um, that no, that is a really good thing. I'm, I'm glad you. Uh, yeah, you're. you're... Uh, it's just life, and I love doing it. I love doing these kind of stories, anyway. Okay. All right. Well, there you go. There you have it. Uh, the, the man himself, Louis, joining us for the show today, and and first up, I guess, on the old hit parade. Mm. No, no, wait, wait. Before that. Before that, I do have to mention that today's uh, episode and, and coffee and cigarettes is partially brought to you by the fine folks at Tim Hortons New York City. Now with eight, yes, count them, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, fine locations throughout the city to serve your coffee and baked goods needs. Yes, right there. So there you have it. <coughs> yes, the Tim Hortons Delio did it right there. Okay. Uh, Moving on now. Uh, If you are interested in this or many of our other shows, you can always whip on over to HTLA Radio, the number one, dot com. That's right. HTLA Radio One dot com. And check out all the wholesome goodness there for you. We've uh, we've torn down all the Christmas decorations They're They're no longer smacking you in the face there with a big cold trout anymore. (laughs) We've taken them down. There, it, it's it's just nice and calm and quiet now. There we are, and it's uh, back to business for the 2015, which is just around the corner, just now. Two count them, two days away, 48 hours. My goodness, what are we going to do in 2015? Well, I can tell you what we're not going to be doing in 2015. That's right, <laughs> sitting here wondering what our lives really meant. Oh, you know, it's... It's kind of retrospective, you know. We... We look back on a... Another year, 2014, and... Say to ourselves... God, that sucked. Yes. Yes, it sucked. It was horrible. It was filled with all kinds of nastiness... 
and Obama. It was filled with Ferguson and Sharpton Shuffle. And now, now we look towards 2015 and think to ourselves, my God, it's going to be all new. There won't be any Obama or Sharpton Shuffle. No, because we've come up with new technologies to remove tattoos. We've got brighter things on the horizon, like finding the 162 dead on that new plane crash. All kinds of things await us in 2015, and I, for one, can't wait to get there. Yeah, okay, enough of that. All right, well, <clears throat> yes, uh, what did you think about that, Louis? The music yeah. is fantastic. Yeah? Oh, you got to hear it. Uh, well, I did. I just played it. You know, there was that, yeah, playing thing. Then I was talking. 2014, 2015, no. Well, screw you then. Fine, I know the kids liked it. <laughs> That's right. I've still got the kids from Crash Talk over here sequestered in, in Studio 2 here. Yes, I'm, I'm being a little... I, I guess I'm breaching my contract with them. Oh, well. Who cares? Well, moving right along, I'd like to welcome Devilon Crawford to the show. She's here with bells on. Yes, as she always is. Uh, and, of course, Joanne Bagnall. Yes. And uh, what have I got for you today? All kinds of stuff for you today. So, geez, I've, I'm already 11 minutes, 37 seconds in. I haven't even gotten to the first story. Here it is. Hold on to your butts. Let's go. Obama hails the end. Like he said he was going to do in 2007. Here it is in the end of 2014. He is announcing the end of combat operations in Afghanistan. Yeah. There it is. Mm hmm. <laughs> yeah, that only took seven years. Yeah, what a, what a good deal. Awesome. Always when, always with a female having a relationship, married or single, it's always better that they do the leaving. Does it? <laughs> if you do the leaving, it keeps it that lingering thing. You know what I mean? Mm. Yes, yes, I know all too well that lingering feeling, Louis. Thank you very much for that. Um. <laughs> no, no, eighty-eight. Thousand dollars a year they make, <clears throat> approximately average. 80. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm no. I'm just going to stop you right there because you've already said that today. You haven't told us who makes eighty-eight thousand dollars a year, or why we're spending eighty-eight million dollars a year for whatever that is you're talking about. We, we're we're just we're just going to move on. Uh, it's just life, and I love doing it. I love doing these kind of stories, anyway. Well, good, good, and this is a good one because. President Obama is, indeed, hailing the end of U.S. combat operations in Afghanistan. Yes. He said that at a Sunday ceremony in Kabul. Quote, marks a milestone for the United States. It sure does. For more than 13 years now, ever since nearly 3,000 innocent lives were taken from us on 9-11, our nation has been at war in Afghanistan. Yes, now thanks to the extraordinary sacrifices of our men and women in uniform, our combat mission in Afghanistan is ending, and the longest war in American history is coming to a responsible, <laughs> he used this word, responsible, conclusion. <laughs> oh, sure. The United States and allies will maintain, of course, a small force of around 13,500 service members in Afghanistan. Why, you may ask? Hmm. Well, I'm glad you asked, because we still have to continue training those local security forces that we have been trying to train for the last 13 years to no avail, because they're absolute drilling morons with weapons. And, of course, assisting in counterterrorism operations like funding new CIA groups <clears throat> that will come back and bite us in the ass in 20 years' time. Obama said that U.S. allies and troops, uh, which hit a peak of 140,000 four years ago, deserve praise for devastating the core of al-Qaeda leadership. <laughs> really? I, I thought a couple of years ago he... he 
laid that on a small SEAL team, and they took care of things at the core there. thought that was, okay, I, I guess I'm mistaken. <laughs> yes, delivering justice to Osama bin Laden, disrupting terrorist plots, and saving countless, countless, countless American lives. You filthy American pigs. No longer will my men be forced to bow down to your pantyhose wearing imperialism. Each week, we will raise pillars of holy fire in each of your cities until our demands are met. Oh, yes, thank you. I did that on my iPhone. The president added, we are safer and our nation is more secure because of their service. More than 2,200 American patriots lost their lives in Afghanistan, Obama said. And, quote, we pledge to stand with their gold star families <laughs> who need the everlasting love and support of a grateful nation. Well, haven't we heard that before, veterans? <laughs> yes. Ah, uh, the Gold Star families. Well, I guess in 2015, the Gold Star families of Afghanistan uh, troops there who've lost their lives can, can rejoice in the gold and riches that will be adorned to them to try and pay for their loved one's absence. Yeah, I guess that's what he's going to go for with all that money he prints up at the mint that doesn't amount to a stack of beans. The United States also pledges, quote, to give our many wounded warriors with wounds seen and unseen the world-class care and treatment they have earned, he said. <laughs> ah, oh, this is good. This is good. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure there are veterans who listen to our show here. And, and wow, you guys got to be kind of rolling around on the floor if it didn't hurt so goddamn much. Can't even get uh, any kind of, like, zero. I'm talking zero dollar funding for a wounded vets and dog program. Yeah, you heard me right. <laughs> a wounded vet and a dog. Yes. Because all our vets that come back from war, whether it's emotionally scarred or physical, they qualify for certain programs and things. And one of the programs that they qualify for that I was made aware of just a couple of weeks ago was the... Uh, Wounded Warriors, uh, I think it's the, the Wounded Warriors Buddy Program or something. Basically, the idea of it is that they take these dogs from shelters that, you know, need need a home, and they take these wounded vets who, well, oftentimes need a home as well, and they, they pair them up with a little battle buddy, a little furry battle buddy, and, and the, the vet gets a dog, and he's responsible for the dog and has to take care of the dog and protect the dog, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the dog's job is to provide that companionship and that, that battle buddy psychology in, in back in the real world here to help both the dog and master uh, actually get on with day-to-day -day things and, and live healthier lives. And, and this program only, only does 24 dogs at a time uh, with vets. And they only do that because they are only, underscore the word only, only publicly funded. There, there is no, there, there's no government programs or initiatives, state or federal, that give dollar one to this program. And, and looking into it, because I, I did, looking into it, <clears throat> they don't. They don't fund a good majority. In, in fact, I could say the vast majority of any of these programs for vets, they're all usually run by public donation. Isn't that kind of sad? Well, I just thought I'd throw that in there before I continued on. Because the president isn't done rubbing it all in yet. No. He goes on to say, Our courageous military and diplomatic personnel in Afghanistan, along with our NATO allies and coalition partners, have helped the Afghan people reclaim their communities and mountains. Take the lead for their own security. Hold historic elections that... Yeah, really? Are you kidding? I've seen the video. Uh, complete the first democratic transfer of power in their country's history. That's because it's not actually their democratic power, but thanks for playing. 
We honor the profound sacrifices that have made all of this progress possible. We salute every American, military, and civilian, including our dedicated diplomats and development workers who have served in Afghanistan, many on multiple tours just as their families have sacrificed at home. Afghan remains a dangerous place, and the Afghan people and their security forces continue to make tremendous sacrifices in defense of their country. Really? Because those uh, trained Afghan militia you keep talking about, seen videos of them too, standing around, not even really knowing to do what, what to do with their weapons. They're, they're in helmets that make them look like, what was that, uh, Dark Nader or something, that, that stupid character from that uh, that film, that Star Wars parody film, Dork, Dork Darth, I don't know. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, they look pretty stupid, and uh, I don't think they're going to uh, maintain any security, but thanks for playing. <sighs> Along with our allies and partners, we will maintain a limited military presence. Presence. <laughs> presidents in Afghanistan to train, advise, and assist those Afghan forces and conduct counter-terrorism operations against the remnants of al-Qaeda. Yes, they're only remnants now. Our personnel will continue to face risks, but this reflects the enduring commitment of the United States to the Afghan people and to a united, secure, and sovereign Afghanistan that is completely democratic, under our control, and never again used as a source of attacks against our nation. He closes by saying the past 13 years have tested our nation and our military, but compared to the nearly 180,000 American troops in Iraq and Afghanistan when I took office, we now have fewer than 15,000 in those countries. So now, my Islamic brethren, is the time to strike. I, I'm, no, okay, no, he didn't say that. Some 90% of our troops are at home. Our military remains the finest in the world, and we will remain vigilant against terrorist attacks and in defense of the freedoms and values we hold dear. And with growing prosperity here at home, we enter a new year with new confidence indebted to our fellow Americans in uniform who keep us safe and free. Thank you very much. Yes, there he goes. <laughs> oh, there's a good dog and pony to show to start the... Uh, start the first quarter out with this show today so we're gonna go for that first two minute commercial break when we come back we'll get into some i don't know lawsuits civil rights yeah baby what if there was a coffee that was sourced from some of the world's most renowned growing regions. Abundant with rich, fertile soil. What if this coffee was picked at the perfect moment, then packed meticulously and shipped carefully to be roasted under the watchful eye of coffee masters? What if it was expertly blended, ground, and sealed? ensuring maximum flavor and freshness. Then brewed in small batches and always served fresh within 20 minutes, just the way you like it. Now what if this coffee just happened to be the coffee you already know and love? Tim Hortons, always fresh, always great tasting coffee. Instead of mailing everyone my vacation photos, I'm saving a ton of time by posting them to my wall. Ooh, I like that one. It's so quick. It's just like my car insurance. I save 15% in just 15 minutes. I save more than that in half the time. I unfriend you. That's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. 15 minutes for a quote isn't how it works anymore. With eSurance, seven and a half minutes could save you on car insurance. Welcome to the modern world. eSurance, backed by Allstate. Click or call. I've been eating Egg McMuffins since 1984. But when I saw Taco Bell made a waffle taco, I figured I would get with the times. So I got a haircut and I got some tighter pants. Lost my flip phone, got a smartphone, even took down my lover boy poster. Now I'm eating waffle tacos and AM crunch wraps. And I just made like $700 on Craigslist. Move on from your old McDonald breakfast with Taco Bell's exciting new breakfast menu. 
I always said shoes are like women. They inspire beautiful music. But what about these? Stilettos sound like this. What does my fragrance inspire? Mmm, that's got soul. My ties are beautiful. They don't need music. Bringing the stars together. That's the magic of Macy's. White Rum has a new captain. Introducing the all-new Captain Morgan White Rum. Five times distilled for a smoother taste. Yeah, baby. Oh, yeah. Mm -mm -mm. That's right. A little bit of the Barry White coming back there for you, baby. Yeah. Well, welcome back to the program. Still... Still a nice, nice, relaxing, mild, 42 degrees Central Park, clear skies, sun is shining. Couldn't ask for a better day on this December 29th, I say. But hey, what do I know? I'm not the weatherman. <laughs> there you go. So welcome back to the show, Coffee and Cigarettes, for today's Monday Mocha. And next up is, yes, lawsuits and, and yes, civil rights, but not necessarily together. In fact, this next story is quite a, quite a riveter, actually. When you think about it, <laughs> we, we all know about the lawsuits that have been going on for, well, actually over a decade, actually a number of decades, about gun manufacturers. Yes, we got to nail those gun manufacturers for Columbine. we got to nail those gun manufacturers because some black guy decides to take a, an iron to somebody's skull and blow them away. Yes, it's the gun manufacturer's fault. Well, in this new lawsuit, yes... This lawsuit seeks to actually make a drug maker pay for OxyContin abuse. Huh? <laughs> there you go. Uh, it's just life, and I love doing it. I love doing these kind of stories anyway. Why is it one time a month women go insane for 30 days? Uh, because they're out of OxyContin? Oh, yes, he did. He brought in the drum. He's got the drum, ladies and gentlemen, doll. That's right, you better run for the hills, gang, because I got me my drum. Oh, Wayne Pierce, where are you? Oh, nothing but a trail of smoke back to Reno. Oh, that's right. Gone like the wind, back. Right there, right there, I've got it. I'm not letting it go, right, kids? <laughs> that's right, screw them. You know how to spell my last name on the check, right? It's Louis Lawless. Yes, yes, if you'd only contribute something. Sex is only the tip of the iceberg. <sighs> I know, I know. And we don't often talk about sex on this show, but hey, I'm in the middle of a story here now. Just be quiet and listen up. It's important. I don't know why, but it's important. Prescription drug abuse has killed more than 20,000 Am Americans a year. Yes, it's filled jails and treatment centers and spawned a resurgence in heroin use, apparently. Well, you know what they say. Smoking cigarettes is just a gateway to crack. <laughs> and nowhere is the pill problem more prevalent than in Kentucky's Appalachian Mountains, where officials trace its roots to the aggressive marketing of one potent drug in particular, that is, of course, OxyContin. For seven years, they've forged ahead with a civil lawsuit that seeks to make drug maker Purdue Pharma pay. As early as next year, it could bring the first ever jury trial pitting Purdue against an addiction-plagued state over the painkiller, which experts say may lead m more communities to file subsequent suits. Chicago and two California counties already have. Quote, this is about holding them accountable, end quote, says Kentucky's Attorney General Jack Conway. He says they played a preeminent role in the state's drug problem. This started to explode in the mid-1990s when Purdue Pharma was making OxyContin, the resulting opiate epidemic. 
is apparently a direct result. The suit alleges that an aggressive and deceptive marketing campaign misled doctors, consumers, and the government about OxyContin's addiction risks, ultimately settling taxpayers with millions of dollars in social health care and other costs. <laughs> I guess that's why that's why they've been off my butt for smoking these last seven or eight years. They're all all focusing on OxyContin. That's it. <laughs> Well, the, the suit alleges that uh, this marketing campaign in particular uh, led to this. Company lawyers in legal documents say more than a billion dollars is at stake and cite the potential for a ruinous verdict. As typically it's difficult to find drug companies liable for harm caused by their products, University of Louisville's law professor Timothy Hall says Kentucky, Kentucky's suit frames the issue in a new way, taking a page from the fight against big tobacco. We disagree with the merits of this lawsuit, says a statement from Richard Silbert, associate general counsel for the Connecticut-based Purdue. Courts in Kentucky and elsewhere have dismissed claims against Purdue because the evidence did not establish that their marketing, in specific, caused the harm they allege. We believe that the Commonwealth likewise won't be able to show it. No one doubts Kentucky is one of the nation's biggest drug problems, a common refrain in Kentucky's hard scrabble hills, is that an entire generation has been lost to pain pill abuse, with overdoses tearing children from parents and parents from children. Brad Ellis, 37, of Louisa, Kentucky, says he was first prescribed OxyContin after a back injury while in the Army. By the time he got home in 2001, he was hooked. We went from doctor to doctor in Appalachia seeking pill scripts and paid people to bring the drugs and from pill mills in Florida. He crushed and snorted them for a quick high. <laughs> Addiction wrecked his life, leading to a divorce, broken relationships with children and parents, and jail time. He withered away to 118 pounds, a walking skeleton. It was almost a constant addiction for 17 years, said Ellis, who has been sober now for 23 months. Pain pills in this area are huge. Drove this region crazy. Yeah. With more than its share of poverty, illness, and chronic pain, Appalachia's coal country was vulnerable to a pain pill abuse when this drug twice as potent as morphine came along. Shortly after OxyContin's federal approval in 1995, the lawsuit alleges, Purdue employees promoted the long-acting oxycodone medication as less addictive than immediate-release opioids, telling some healthcare providers that the drug didn't even cause a buzz. <sighs> a buzz. Really? Is that what we're talking about? Ah. Yeah, didn't think so. Yeah, well, <clears throat> there's a, there's a number of factors that they haven't, of course, uh, put in the old uh, article here yet, but we won't go quite into those yet. Mm. Yeah. Okay, well, OxyContin prescriptions for cancer pain shot up tenfold between 1997 and 2002. A 2004 report by the then U.S. General Accounting Office says Purdue encouraged primary care doctors to prescribe the drug for a wide range of injuries and conditions, not just severe pain with serious illnesses like cancer. The DEA complained that the company promoted this sort of prescribing to doctors who weren't well-trained in pain management, while also giving out OxyContin starter coupons for patients and promotional items such as fishing hats and plush seal toys, which are now sold online as collector's items. Yeah, look, it's little Stevie the Seal, the Oxycontin Seal. That was a mistake on my part. <laughs> uh, really? And, and fishing hats. Now, who wouldn't want a fishing hat? Uh, yeah, okay. All right. Well, in May of 2007, settlement of a Virginia criminal case, Purdue and three executives pleaded guilty to federal charges that they intentionally misled doctors, regulators, and, of course, patients about OxyContin's addiction risk and potential for misuse. Purdue agreed to pay $600 million in fines, the executives $34.5 million in total. A portion went to reimburse states, Medicaid programs, 
but Kentucky refused the $500,000 it was offered. Filing its own lawsuit in Pike Circuit Court with Pike County as a co-defendant, Purdue had it moved to a federal court and it resided in New York for years until being returned to Pike County, where Pike, but not the state, settled its claims. All the while, Kentucky was drowning in a sea of prescription pills. (laughs) Oxycontin became so ubiquitous it was dubbed hillbilly heroin. Oh, that's got to get a drum. Oh, yeah. Retail distribution of oxycodone skyrocketed 11-fold between 97 and 2010, and Kentuckians abused opioids and died of overdoses at some of the nation's highest rates. Oxycontin changed the face of addiction in this region, said Don Smoot, president of the Eastern Kentucky Anti-Drug Organization, Operation Unite. It made addicts out of people who otherwise weren't. It drove this region crazy. When the federal government approved the abuse deterrent formulation of OxyContin in 2010, many addicts turned to other opioids, mostly pills, but also heroin. Yes. Well, when they did that, actually, um, they actually made the uh, pills, um, what the hell is it? (sighs) Not indestructible. They they made them non-crushable, or if, if you crush them up to snort them, I don't know, the chunks were not snortable or something. I don't know. I'm not a drug addict, damn it. I'm not a drug addict. <sighs> the music is fantastic. <laughs> oh, you got to hear it. Mm. You got some Oxycontin over there I don't know about? Uh, it's just life, and I love doing it. I love doing these kind of stories anyway. Uh, yeah, I bet you do. Mm-mm-mm. No, oh, I only got one drug, ladies and gentlemen. That's right. Cigarettes. Ha <laughs> ha. There you go. And they, they haven't taken those away yet. <laughs> so I'm okay. And I, I can't crush my cigarettes and snort them. Well, I guess I could. Yeah, yeah I could. Yeah, I could. Would, would that be a good thing, though? You love to do that kind of stuff. You always did. What? And put your name up there and dress in different stuff. So fantastic. Yeah. Uh, if I can be of any help, let me know. So what's the email address? You want to you wanna help me snort my cigarettes? Oh, yeah. Use power. That's why power is corrupt, and it is. We see it every day. We see it in every job. It's the same thing. Yeah, well, what can you do? What can you do? Well, Purdue hopes to prevail. Silbert, the Purdue lawyer, agrees that prescription drug abuse is a serious problem and says that's why the company reformulated the drug in 2010 to make it impossible to snort or inject. Well, look at that. They inject it, too. Purdue officials remain confident they will prevail, as they did in 2001, Kentucky lawsuit brought by addicts. In that case, a U.S. District Court judge wrote that they, quote, failed to produce any evidence showing that the defendant's marketing, promotional, or distribution practices had even caused even one tablet of OxyContin to be inappropriately prescribed or diverted. And that's likely the way this would turn out, I would think. Purdue acknowledges the state's suit will be tougher, especially since their request to move it out of Pike County was denied. In a survey, their expert found that 7 in 10 people agreed OxyContin has devastated local residents' lives. Now, see, they're stacking the jury by just not stacking the jury. Well, we just won't move the venue. The jury's already stacked because it's made up of all the folks living around here and they're all butthurt, so yeah, you're going to have a prejudiced jury there. That can't be allowed. Why would that be allowed? Well, the fight has now turned to the issue of request for admissions, or what the plaintiff asked the defendant to admit, including allegations that Purdue caused OxyContin to be excessively overprescribed. Right, so the doctors now... we. <laughs> They don't have any responsibility. The doctors, no, they just got their pad and kind of like President Obama signing his little memo pad, you know, the doctors just sign the pad and, and get it out of there because it's not the doctor's fault. It's clearly the company that made the pill. You see what I'm saying? It's not the shooter's fault. It's the company that made the gun. It's the same argument and it's redundant and ridiculous. Man, I'd love to be a lawyer for this. Pike County Circuit Court Judge Stephen Combs ruled that Purdue missed a deadline to respond to the state's admissions request, effectively meaning that the company is considered to have admitted 
to the whole list. While he ruled the opposite way for co-defendant Abbott Laboratories, Purdue appealed the decision and lost, then appealed again to the state Supreme Court, which hasn't yet ruled. If the decision isn't overturned, Purdue lawyers say that it, it will limit them a great deal in defending themselves on the case's merits. Combs' orders confront Purdue with the risk of an immense and ruinous judgment, and damages sought could produce a record-breaking verdict, lawyers wrote in court documents. Conway says he's preparing for trial, but is open to a fair settlement that would, like any money, to go towards drug education and treatment. Treatment is what saved Ellis, who now works as a cook at Chad's Hope in Manchester, Kentucky, a faith-based treatment center where he got clean. Ellis blames only himself for his addiction and says only God could free him from its grip. Quote, God, what pulled me up, he says, I don't even crave the drug anymore. There you go. Yeah, we got to go for another two-minute break. But when we come back, I've got another drug addict for you. That's right. <laughs> it's going to be time for the Sharpton Shuffle back in two. Good morning. Welcome to Tim Horton's Cafe and Bake Shop, where fresh always tastes better. What can I make you this morning? How about our new flatbread breakfast paninis? Made fresh, just for you, with your favorite breakfast ingredients on maple or multigrain flatbread, then grilled to hot, melted perfection. Just $2.99. Who couldn't warm up to that? Tim Horton's Cafe and Bake Shop, where quality really does meet value. I've been eating Egg McMuffin since 1984. But when I saw Taco Bell made a waffle taco, I figured I would get with the times. So I got a haircut and I got some tighter pants. Lost my flip phone, got a smartphone, even took down my lover boy poster. Now I'm eating waffle tacos and AM crunch wraps. And I just made like $700 on Craigslist. Move on from your old McDonald breakfast with Taco Bell's exciting new breakfast menu. I always said shoes are like women. They inspire beautiful music. But what about these? Stilettos sound like this. What does my fragrance inspire? Mmm, that's got soul. My ties are beautiful. They don't need music. Bringing the stars together, that's the magic of Macy's. You walked into the hotel as a five. But when she saw the room, you turned into a weird seven. When she saw the rooftop pool, you went to eleven. You two should probably get a room. Oh, that's right. You already did. At Planet Earth's number one accommodation site, Booking.com. Booking. Yeah. Glasses. White Rum has a new captain. Introducing the all-new Captain Morgan White Rum. Five times distilled for a smoother taste. Uh, yes, you are listening to Coffee and Cigarettes on HTLA Radio Fun. That's right, HTLA Radio 1, New York. 42 degrees, Central Park still sunny. Yes. No rain, no snow coming. No, it's going to be a nice uh, week right into 2015 here in the big city. Into Big Apple. Yeah, there you go. And, uh, <clears throat> ah, excuse me, pardon me. Those uh, Oxycontin cigarettes are giving me a rush. <laughs> With no pesky afterbuzz. Ah, there we go. 
Uh, so, yeah, let's blast through a couple of these. We're running a little behind today as we've been cut down to one hour per day. Yes, the, the hour and a half normal Monday mocha and Friday frappuccino. Well, the big boss lady said that's enough, 60 minutes a day, five days a week, that's all you get, move on. So there we go. So uh, i got to cover some stuff that's in the descripto for the show. That's right, we do. Snowy New Year's Eve in Las Vegas. Apparently, a cold blast consuming much of western U.S. will be frigid, bring frigid temperatures and a chance of snow to even Las Vegas on New Year's Eve, according to the National Weather Service. Chances are building for snow this week in Reno with high temperatures below freezing. Overnight lows approaching single digits and a potential dusting in time for Tuesday morning's commute. Ooh. Reno's best chance for snow is likely to come before revelers enjoy fireworks downtown on Wednesday night, but forecast confidence is still low, the National Weather Service said in a statement. It's possible the storm could come through relatively dry, producing little snow. It's possible it could snow like a bugger. We could have 17 feet and nobody would be none the wiser because we're the National Weather Service. Thank you very much. There you go. There's your, your snow in Las Vegas news right there. Boom. 46 minutes into the show. Done. Ah, uh, yes, and good old Asia Flight 850. No, 8501. Air Asia Flight 8501. What do we know? Well, the Air Asia Flight 8501 disappeared from radar screen Sunday with 162 people aboard. Here's what we know. The Airbus A320, well, yeah, another one of those, those trans-dimensional airplanes that uh, seem to be the go-to airplane when you want to disappear, well, 160 to 350 people, flew out of Suburbaya, Indonesia at around 5.35 a.m. local time on Sunday. 5.35 Eastern PM Saturday, bound for Singapore. Less than 40 minutes later, the pilot radioed air traffic control asking to increase the plane's altitude due to weather. Heavy storms were reported in the area. Minutes later, and about an hour before the plane was scheduled to land in Singapore, the plane lost contact with controllers and disappeared from radar. AccuWeather meteorologist Tyler Royce tells USA Today that the area along the flight path was blasted by a string of severe thunderstorms when the jet disappeared. Two days of searching by 30 ships and 50 aircraft have failed to locate the plane or its debris. The second day's effort on Monday was called off because of darkness. Yes, the search was scheduled to resume at dawn on Tuesday and will be extended to include land, according to Indonesian authorities. And the Indonesians, well, they don't have a good track record for searching and finding things, do they? And here's a little... I guess happy tidbit to this story. There was a family of 10 who were ticketed and set to be on that flight, but they missed that doomed flight by only 10 minutes. Some 162 passengers and crew are missing and presumed lost in the AirAsia Flight 8501, but the total would be a lot higher if the air airline hadn't changed the departure time to two hours earlier than originally scheduled. Christian Awadi was one of 10 members of an extended family, including her 7-month-old son, another infant, booked on the flight, who missed it by only minutes. After they missed emails and phone calls from the airline earlier in the month to inform them of the change to 5.35 a.m., the Sydney Morning Herald reports. Her husband and brother-in-law arrived in time to see latecomers race for the plane yesterday morning, but they decided to wait for the rest of the group and arrive in a second plane. While the group was still trying to negotiate a later flight with the airline staff, they were informed that the plane had disappeared. Well, there you go. If that isn't a stroke, a freaking lock, I don't know what is. No, I don't. Uh, now let's move on to mall brawl, shall we? Yes, and I'm not talking the cigarette. Uh, teens engage in mall brawls. Yes, trendy mall brawls after Christmas. A number of fights, most involving teenagers, broke out at malls in the days following Christmas, according to numerous media reports across the country. The fights, which do not appear to be connected, occurred at malls across the country. Here are the details of a select number of incidences. Monroeville Mall in Pittsburgh, at least two people were taken to the hospital and two others were arrested after fights broke out Friday evening at the mall, according to the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. More than six fights reportedly occurred in the mall from 5 to 8.30 p.m. Officers don't think the event was coordinated, but as many as 1,000 teenagers showed up at the mall after hearing about it on social media, mall security officers told the Gazette. 
Chicago Ridge Mall in Chicago, Illinois. The shopping center was evacuated and closed after a fight broke out there Saturday, according to the Chicago Tribune. There were reports of shots fired, but police said the sound was actually someone banging pots together to disperse the crowd, according to the Tribune. Independence Center Mall in Independence, Missouri. A large disturbance Friday night in the mall involved two to 300 teenagers, the Kansas City Star reported. Police referred to the crowd referred to the crowd where no one was injured and there were no arrests as a flash mob, according to the Star. Hundreds of teens congregated, but the only damage was a door that was knocked off its hinge. Fights that occurred outside the mall were quickly broken up, the Star also reported. Yeah, no, that's not uh, <clears throat> that's not coordinated at all. You know, two to three hundred teens? Nah, that's not coordinated. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the Arden Fair Mall in Sacramento, California. The California Mall closed an hour and a half early as several teens were arrested after a large fight Friday night, according to KCRA in Sacramento. A whole bunch of people got up and started running, and everybody was fighting, and security officers were tackling people, Kelsey Acuna said, a bystander at the mall. She told KCRA the mall reopened Saturday as normal. Opry Mills Mall in Nashville, Tennessee. Witnesses said they saw dozens of teens fighting Saturday night, according to WTVF in Nashville. However, the mall's general manager, Jad Murphy, said the reports were overblown. Quote, There were three minor altercations involving a few teens and many onlookers, but they were halted quickly by our crack security team with no reported injuries, Murphy said in a statement to WTVF. Yeah. No, that's not coordinated at all. No. Seven malls, one night. No, absolutely not. And before I get into the uh, Sharpton Shuffle, because you know that's that's one oxycontin guy uh, you want to shuffle with. <laughs> yes, I do have to tell you all something. Well, I I'm not personally excited about it. it it's a step forward in tattoo technology. Okay, so it's exciting on that end. But I've got my tattoos, and I like them, so I, I wouldn't want to get them removed. But, hey, good news for you people out there who do, because in Cincinnati, the latest tattoo removal device promises to be faster, less likely to damage skin, and more thorough in erasing that youthful indiscretion. <laughs> yes. An Ohio plastic surgeon is the first in the Cincinnati area to offer the PicoSure laser. PicoSure re actually received Food and Drug Administration approval in 2012. Dr. John Mendelshan studied the phenomenon of tattoos and decided to take the $295,000 plunge for the device. With the acquisition of the PicoSure laser, Joel Hearn now has an opportunity to redeem himself in the eyes of his six-year-old son. Oh, yes, because your six-year-old is going to look down on you for having a tattoo as an adult. Good good call. Yeah. No. <laughs> Can you give me any help for $25,000? <laughs> <laughs> mm. Really? I go a half an hour, do I get 50000 <laughs> <laughs> You're dead serious, aren't you? 20, I, tried to, I need to try and raise $25,000 to enter in the Academy Awards. Uh -huh. And I think it's a fantastic mm. risk because we have a tremendous chance. Well, Two sure. Uh, there's about 200 members that vote on it, and they all get, you have to give them a DVD now. I know, and you still haven't told us what the film is. Uh, it's just life, and I love doing it. I love doing these kind of stories anyway. Mm -hmm. and the music is fantastic. Yeah. Oh, you got to hear it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm with you. <clears throat> yes, the six-year-old son is looking down on his father for having tattoos. Give me a break. The tipping point for me was when my son noticed them and started asking how I got them. Why I got them, said Hearn, 35, running his right hand over his left upper arm. I didn't have good answers for him. <laughs> well, well, then that's your mistake, isn't it? Then he said, I don't like it, and that was it. Mendelssohn's practice had focused on standard cosmetic surgery, facelifts, chin tucks, Botox injections, that kind of thing. Though potential customers had called to inquire... He had not considered adding a tattoo removal system to his menu of services. But the market for removal could be growing. Millennials by the millions have embraced a tattoo culture and dimmed the stigma of skin art. 
turning it from outlaw to mainstream. But as they age, the question of removal looms. Yes. Obviously, this story was written by somebody with no tattoos. Yeah, and I can tell that, because there's not a single one I'd lose. Duh. When people hit their 30s, and of course now they're in the workforce and they're having children, suddenly stigma matters, said Mendelssohn. No, no, PC matters, Mendelssohn. And you're another sucker with the PC thing. Yeah. Intrigued by the inking and removal of tattoos, yes, the past summer, uh, this past summer actually, Mendelssohn came across an article about a new laser treatment that delivered pulses of picoseconds, or one trillionth of a second. A significant advance, a trillionth of a second is to a second as a second is to 300 or 3,000, sorry, wow, 31,700 years in a differential time scale. Hmm. How about that, Louis? A differential time scale. Uh, we, we were five steps away from winning the Academy Award. Uh huh. And we didn't. I think you're caught in a differential time scale. That was a mistake on my part. Yeah. <laughs> How many different families do you have? <clears throat> well, seven or eight, ten, twelve, I don't know, but neither one of my 700 million children have ever looked down at me because I have tattoos. Let's move on. Pico Sure's manufacturer, Sinosure of Westford, Massachusetts, says the device could remove tattoos with fewer applications than older lasers, which, of course, required repeated applications that did not work well on certain skin colors and often damaged the skin. Intrigued by the potential of the new tool, Mendelssohn started studying tattoos. He said, I realized I didn't really understand tattoos. What I did know was that the technology to remove them didn't really work. Mendelssohn talked to tattoo artists to learn about the art, even sitting in on inkings with James Dreyer, owner of Asylum Tattoo. It used to be that removing the laser was like a zap, and if the person operating the laser wasn't experienced with it, they could cause scarring. And you're not even going to get rid of the tattoo, said Dreyer. Then you damage the skin and put someone at a higher risk for skin cancer. Yeah, okay. At tattoo conventions, where laser companies offer removals on the spot as demonstrations, Dreyer watched as the technology improved. And he's impressed with the PicoSure. It's a brand new version and we still have to wait and see, but it looks very good from what I'm seeing right now, he says. Removal takes between 1 and 12 sessions, each 6 weeks apart, to allow for healing, depending on the color combination and the acreage of the tattoo. The price for removal, on average, is between $1,200 and $1,800, Mendelssohn said. <laughs> this is one of the most exciting things I've done in my practice, he said. Well, of course it is to you. $1,800, bucks, really? Hmm. 1800 but yeah, I guess it's exciting. 13 years ago, Hearn was fresh out of Bowling Green State University and deeply involved in skateboarding. The sport has a culture that lends itself to tattoos, Hearn said. It seemed like a good idea at the time. The tattoo on Hearn's upper left arm around the biceps and triceps has a Polynesian pattern with patches deeply inked in black. It cost $800 and took two sessions and five hours each and absolutely hurt, he says. Hearn got a job as a medical supply salesman, which often meant traveling to medical conventions in sunny locales where he would end up poolside with doctors, who all remarked on his ink. Sometimes Hearn wouldn't remove his shirt because I'd rather not be a talking point. Employment plus marriage were two pressures for removal, but the biggest factor was the arrival of his son. Yes, and as the boy grew, well, then the pressure came on. Get rid of the tattoo, Dad. Get rid of the tattoo, Dad. Oh, did I mention get rid of the tattoo, Dad? I'm six years old, and I'm telling you what to do, Dad. <sighs> well, there you go. There's hope for you yet, you, you bunch of losers. <laughs> oh, and we, we ran out of time. We couldn't do the Sharpton Shuffle. Oh, well, you know what? I'm sure he'll be around tomorrow, all ready to give it a jig. Well, thank everybody at HTLA. Thank you, Jenny in the booth, and, of course, Louie for being here. That was a mistake on my part. <laughs> well, maybe, but I appreciate your kind and wonderful service. That was a mistake on my part. Well, that too, yeah. So, uh, join us tonight, nine, nine, eight, nine, no, eight, 
Okay, apparently 8 p.m. Eastern for Straight Talk with Kate and Crash coming up on the HTLA program. And, uh, of course, check it out, HTLA Radio, the number one dot com, HTLA Radio one dot com. Go give it a little kick there. Say, hey, I'm over here. And uh, that's it. Shoutouts again to Devilon Crawford and Joe, Joanne, Bagnall. Thanks for listening. Nice to see you. And uh, that's it, kids. We'll catch you tomorrow. Coffee and cigarettes, 3 p.m. Eastern. And it's going to be a nice day, so you don't even have to bundle up too much. We'll catch you all next time, gang. Got it locked to New York's best talk radio, HTLA Radio 1, New York.